Let's start from the perspective of workers themselves. Let's keep that at the forefront of our thinking rather than trying to plan around legal frameworks or compliance checklists, which is certainly important in terms of the process. But let's start with the perspective of workers. And I think from the worker's perspective, those who are facing exploitation on a daily basis, the most important thing is getting protection and relief, compensation when there's been abuse and raising the overall level of working conditions in those most vulnerable places. Human trafficking doesn't always take the form we first imagine. It can be found at almost any level of an organization's supply chain. What can compliance professionals do to assess human trafficking risk, and how can they leverage the resources of the organizations they work for to help root out this tragic problem? Gwen Hassan is here to help. This is Hidden Traffic. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Hidden Traffic. I am your host, Gwen Hassan. I'm really excited. It seems like we've been working on getting this set up now for a couple of months, but we finally managed to the time zone differences. And I have with me today, Andre Sachenko. And Andre is the Regional Vice President for Labor Programs Asia Pacific, that's a really long title, Andre, for the International Justice Mission, and he is based out of Bangkok in Thailand. So welcome, Andre. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, Gwen. Great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. So let's jump right in. Tell us a little bit about yourself. So how did you come to be working in human trafficking prevention specifically, and how did you end up with International Justice Mission? Fill us in a bit. Thanks, Glenn. You know, it goes back a long way. And when I was young, when I was studying in university, I just learned about myself that I wanted to be part of a better story in the world for people who had gotten an unfair shake, uh, for lack of a better term, people who had been exploited, been abused, been marginalized. I, I just really felt at the core of who I was, that I wanted to be part of a better reality, a better future for some people. I knew I couldn't do everything, but I just felt I wanted to pursue a career that would allow me to do that. And I felt like law was something that could give me tools in that direction. And so I went to law school. And while I was in law school, I found this little startup organization called International Justice Mission. And it seemed like it was a place where a lawyer could use some of their skills to, you know, work with others on the ground in places where really horrible abuse was happening to do just what I had wanted to do. And so just a few years out of law school, I had an opportunity to start with IJM in a role in, in Northern Thailand. And almost 19 years later, I'm still Holy here. Gosh. That's great. I mean, it sounds like a perfect fit on both sides, right? They found the resources that they needed in you and you found an outlet for making the world better also through law practice. What a great kind of matchup between the two of you. Yeah, unbelievable. And I just feel so very fortunate to have been able to do this with wonderful colleagues and doing work that feels like it matters and mm-hmm. feels like I can make a difference to some people. So, All right. So fill us in a little bit more about International Justice Mission. So I know generally that you work with victims of human trafficking to try and bring the perpetrators, their traffickers to justice. I know the organization does a lot of work around kind of prevention of online exploitation, especially related to children. But is it fair to say that maybe the crux of your work is in working with foreign governments where human trafficking is really prevalent to try and make justice system reforms and legislative and regulatory reforms? Or am I missing the boat there? Tell us a bit more about it. Really got it, Gwen. You really got it. (laughs) Thank you very much. At IJM, we start from a place of recognizing that human trafficking is actually a choice. It's a choice by a person with more power or actually a group or a network in a position of power to commodify or take away the choices of another person, right? So we're talking about traffickers or forced labor criminals or whatever label you want to put on it who are aiming to enslave their victims in a situation of exploitation using one of many different coercive and deceptive practices. And they're doing it because it's profitable and they can get away with it. And so we're looking to enact or work with partners on a behavior change project, really focused on traffickers. 
are looking to find ways to disincentivize traffickers or would-be traffickers, and in this case, to run their businesses different. So our understanding and from experience, one of the most convincing ways to convince traffickers to do something different is the introduction of a real threat of punishment or penalties and to focus those on places where the trafficking crimes are actually occurring at greatest scale. So what we do is then we have teams and we have partners and programs around the world working with local authorities, as you said, to strengthen the systems of protection for survivors and vulnerable communities. And we're empowering survivors through individual cases, through building capacity of systems, like through training and policy strengthening, working directly with frontline officials, and we're working to measure impact so that we can learn what's working well. And I lead a program in Southeast Asia focused on strengthening prevention of trafficking crimes against most vulnerable workers through enforcement of laws. As you said, we also have programs focused on enforcing or preventing crimes against children, online sexual exploitation. But my program is focused on worker protection. And so we think that we'll be able to show over time in this space, in these countries, that the consistent enforcement of anti-forced labor laws in ways that work for workers will actually drive down rates of forced labor and labor trafficking across sectors and supply chains in the countries where we're working. And, and right now for our program, that's Thailand, Cambodia, Malaysia, and Indonesia. That's quite a scope. That's a lot of places. I love what you said about kind of the I don't even know if this is a word, the commoditization, <laughs> the commodifying of the choices of people who are under power. And I think that's such an elegant way to describe what trafficking is, right? It's that people who have power are making money off the backs of people who don't. And so often that falls into the worker category in Southeast Asia. So fantastic that you were there literally on site working on that. Tell us a bit about maybe a personal connection you've had to your work. I'd love to hear any stories you can share about projects you've had in the past and where you've had real results that you can talk about. Well, I've got a few. I could talk all day about these stories, Gwen, but let's just do a few. So one I can think of is about eight years ago, I was leading our work in southern India and in Tamil Nadu, India. Our work there focuses on labor trafficking, but there the principal word used is bonded labor because people are forced to remain in slave-like jobs through the imposition of debts. And they're held there by debts. And so they're considered to be bonded because their indefinite presence is this sort of collateral for the loan. And so they can only leave once it's fully paid off, which is a practical impossibility. I was just about to say, can they ever actually do that? Or it happens in some cases, but in many, many cases, the, the bonded labor situation continues on for years, decades, and even generations. In Definitely. Ooh. So eight years ago, I was in Tamil Nadu and I was going on my first ever rescue operation in India with a team who had been doing this work for some period of time. And so we were targeting a group of laborers who were working in a rice mill in a small town a couple of hours away from Chennai. And the team had been working with local government in that area for some time, doing a lot of trainings, and had already been in that state working on these cases for over 10 years and had been building up an amount of momentum. So we were excited about testing out what we had been training, some of these good practices and some of these government officials, and we felt like things were starting to catch on in the enforcement of laws. And so that day, there were a group of 29 laborers, plus a number of their small children who had been living in this rice mill for many years. And our team had been there and had documented the situation, had verified that these laborers really wanted out, and then they were in situations of bonded labor. And so we showed up in the morning with a government official, and the government official conducted what we would call a preliminary interview, which just was a, a series of several questions. And I remember just taking in the scene from a distance. And, you know, this is not that big a rice mill, a concrete slab with a big milling machine and a couple of tiny shacks on the side where the 29 laborers and their families lived, tiny shacks, where they had been living, some of them for their whole lives. And this is a, a small town. There were no fences. 
you just would drive up and the market was right across the street, but there was a practical impossibility for the people to actually leave that employment. I mean, they yeah. walk across yeah. the street to the market, but they could not leave that job or that space. And so the government official in that case decided that they were bonded laborers and that he was going to remove them from the facility. They all were eager to go. And within about 15 minutes, they had packed up all of their worldly possessions into a few sacks and loaded them onto a bus that we had brought to bring them. Oh my and God. they all went to the district administrator's office where he conducted a full inquiry that lasted most of the rest of that day. And I think the thing that stands out to me the most about that story is just how willing these laborers were to respond to the possibility of freedom. After having experienced nothing else for their whole lives, after having been treated as subhumans for years, you know, with the support of each other and just a few people who believed and respected them, they were able to bravely recount their experiences during this interview inquiry process. And by the end of the day, this government official, a magistrate, had detained the rice mill owner. Most of the survivors had been issued what were called release certificates, official certificates, declaring that this debt that had been held over their heads was fraudulent and null and void. And he had ensured that the government had allocated land and temporary shelters and brought them actually to their new homes by just after sunset. And I mean, the pace and the magnitude of the change in their lives in just a 24 hour period is was shocking, but their ability, to, their ability to have such a huge role in that process was their ability to rise to that occasion in that moment was amazing. As was your work. I mean, think about the ripple effect that that has. I mean, you have changed the trajectory of the lives of 29 families, which yeah. also have families, which also have children. The scope of what you accomplished in that one project in that one town with that one rice mill spreads throughout the whole community and throughout the whole country. Wow. I'm super impressed. That's amazing. It's worth it. It's worth it for every single one of those circumstances. But even more wonderful is the impact is not limited to that. That's about 2000, that's 2015. And as I said, we measure the impact of our programs, right? And so in 2014, we had conducted a prevalence study together with other NGOs and to measure the rate of bonded labor across the state of Tamil Nadu. And then in 2021, after, you know, a series of these kind of cases and also more policy and the actually really impressive work by the government of Tamil Nadu to lead a sweeping change in how they dealt with bonded labor across the state. The prevalence study was repeated and they found an 82% relative reduction in the rate of bonded labor across the state, which is a shocking decrease in bonded labor in the industries that were most affected by it at that time. And so beyond these 29 people, which by itself is worth it. But beyond those 29 people, that's a practical freeing of hundreds of thousands of people who were in those industries just less than 10 years earlier. To have that kind of effectiveness measure is incredible to me. I mean, so often people will comment to me as I talk to them through the podcast or talk to companies about you know, human trafficking prevention programs. And they will say things like, well, yeah, but we never know if that work really does anything or if it's really effective or, oh, sure, you can talk the right game to a foreign official, but it doesn't make a difference at the end of the day. And so how amazing to be able to point to specific measures that are, hey, no, 82% drop in the prevalence of bonded labor across this region, because for the first time ever, there is a deterrent. There is actual enforcement of laws and people going to jail and people being freed. So fantastic. It's not just this one study. We've seen this also in other, other studies in other places on sex trafficking projects, on other human trafficking projects around the world. We've seen these precipitous drops. And so what we're hoping to be able to offer to the world and to the broader anti-slavery community in the first instance is some replicable and effective models that can point the way towards hopefully more investment because people all around the world want to end human trafficking and modern slavery. Nobody thinks that's okay to have a world where that exists. 
Yeah. And thankfully in the global supply chain community as well, and, and in the compliance community, but also investors and consumers, there's a real interest in seeing an end. So seeing some program strategies that are empirically tested and that are shown to work, hopefully will mean more investment for strategies and projects that actually reduce impunity and protect workers that are the most vulnerable. Then to pivot to Southeast Asia, just a few years later after that India story, I was located here in Thailand and we were focused in a partnership with the Walmart Foundation and the U.S. government on a program to focus on modern slavery in the Thai fishing industry. This was Cambodian workers and Myanmar workers who were trafficked into Thailand and put on boats. And you may have seen or heard news articles about seafood supply chain issues in Thailand that, that had led to journalism reports and a lot of attention, a threat of a ban into EU markets. So there was a lot of attention, right? And so what we did is we started working with justice system agencies in the three different countries, but especially starting with Cambodia and Thailand. And so I remember sitting with some fishing workers or former fishing workers in Cambodia who had returned from and them telling about their experiences of having been trafficked and put on a boat in Thailand and being out at sea and realizing that they didn't know if they would ever get home alive. Often they're like trapped out at sea for months at a time, right? And they don't have any ability to communicate or get off the boat. Right. Yeah, okay. In years, right? And these particular okay. men had experienced and seen violence on the boats and so just knew that they had to get off. And so they jumped off at a port. They didn't know where it was. It turned out it was Malaysia and they eventually made their way home after some other ordeals. Hmm. But, you know, eventually we were able to get home and we had been working with Cambodian authorities and Thai authorities. And so through a, another long series of brave recounting of their experiences and events, and through a lot of support through the process, personally, and sort of put them on a better footing in their lives, these men were able to testify in court and their traffickers were arrested and sentenced to, and imprisoned for trafficking crimes on the Cambodian side and related traffickers on the Thai side. And again, quite empowering for those men to be able to be part of a much bigger impact and very wonderful for us to be able to do that together. To have their voices heard and to have their own agency in being able to defend themselves and speak up for themselves. I mean, that has a measurable value just personally for them. So all right, you mentioned Walmart and their foundation. I'd love to talk a bit about what you think the role of corporations is in this fight, because I mean, certainly, especially in light of ESG concerns and the new EU Sustainability Reporting Directive and the German Supply Chain Act, there's more and more focus on holding companies accountable for their very complex supply chains and knowing what every part of their supply chain is doing. And I know that that's a good start, but I think a lot of companies are struggling to figure out how to make that a reality and how to get to a place where they know where their whole supply chain is and how to map it. But I'm wondering from your perspective, is there a kind of a larger role here that companies should be taking? What should they be doing besides, you know, mapping out their supply chains? Well, thanks, Gwen. And we do appreciate the great amount of time and effort that businesses are putting into thinking this through. I would just say, Let's start from the perspective of workers themselves. Let's keep that at the forefront of our thinking rather than trying to plan around legal frameworks or compliance checklists, which is certainly important in terms of the process, but let's start with the perspective of workers. And I think from the worker's perspective, those who are facing exploitation on a daily basis, the most important thing is getting protection and relief, compensation when there's been abuse and raising the overall level of working conditions in those most vulnerable places. Then if we overlay those ideas with the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, mm -hmm. we can start to narrow down on division of roles and responsibilities, right? So the first uh, principle is, I imagine you and your listeners are well familiar with these, but just to briefly review, principle one is that the state or governments have the duty to protect workers. It's the state that's 
entrusted with the responsibility to end impunity for criminals, then businesses have a duty to respect human rights of all the workers in their supply chains. And all of us have the duty to ensure that workers have access to remedy when they've been exploited, right? So those are the three. And so what businesses can do then, I've got four things in mind. One is that businesses can advocate with governments in the riskiest parts of their supply chain to enforce worker protection laws. So this is a little different than what some businesses may be thinking would be their first step. But on a fairly short examination of their supply chain, I think businesses can identify what places, what countries or what jurisdictions are the riskiest parts of their supply chain in terms of forced labor risk or risk of exploitation to workers. And businesses can actually exert the leverage and the influence that they have with government agencies in those places to ask governments to do their job to protect workers in those places. And that will have a real profound impact to reduce the rates of forced labor happening in the riskiest parts of the supply chain. Especially given that they are employers in those countries through their supply chains. To your point, I think that should give governments a vested interest in working with them. Okay, great point. Yep. All right. What's next? The second one is businesses can support organizations that are actually working with and advocating for the most vulnerable workers. Also, a host of other grassroots organizations and even allowing workers to be part of organized associations or unions. In many places Mm -hmm. around the world, some of the most vulnerable workers in supply chains don't actually have access or even the legal right to organize themselves. And so when we talk about agency, one of the most important for workers is for workers to be able to raise concerns on their own and express their own voice in their workplace. And that's important for workers. So finding organizations that can really empower workers and, and amplify their voices is really important. Third is setting up channels to the point of allowing workers to raise voices, setting up channels for workers to report safely when they've experienced mistreatment in the workplace, right? So sometimes we call these grievance mechanisms or reporting channels and making sure that workers can access government channels when needed, that not only private in-house channels are used, because we know that the power disparity between workers and employers can be pretty big. So sometimes those in-house dispute resolution mechanisms may not always turn out advantageous for the workers. Sometimes there's mixed message, right? Which is there's posters all over that say, please let us know if there's mistreatment happening. But then the local management is saying, you'd better not use that number. And I've seen that happen multiple times. So yeah, the importance of outside of the company, government resources being accessible, extra important. Not to discount the importance of in the house or third party grievance mechanisms. Those are also important. And we recognize that government solutions aren't always immediately the first choice of workers. And many workers won't trust government systems and for good reason. You know, that these systems are not always delivering great results. And so part of what we're doing is trying to set up programs for systems to prove themselves to be better for workers. But over time, the best is for workers to have a slew of choices. So they have some redundancy. Yeah. So the one that works best for them is the one that they can choose. And of course, last, but also very important is that if these internal actions and supply chain codes of conduct, defining those standards and then aligning purchasing decisions Mm -hmm. with those standards is super important. Of course, we see the value of that as well. There's a group within the ABA that has been working really hard on on the model contract clauses for human rights. I think it's version 2.0 that is out right now because of some of that kind of misalignment sometimes where the, the company will have a great supplier code of conduct that says, hey, you know, we treat people fairly. We respect human rights. Either These are the things we do. But then they have supplier contracts that say things like, hey, if we flex up the volume by 100%, you will meet that or you'll pay a penalty of X, Y, Z, kind of burying their head in the sand to the idea that, well, if you require that kind of a flex in in volume, the only way a company in, you know, name the country can meet that is by bringing in trafficked workers. So yeah, you can't speak out of both sides of your mouth there. There has to be an alignment between the two. All right. So I know you've got some companies that are partnering with you already. I think you refer to them as corporate partners. Could you tell us a little bit about some of the projects that you've worked on? I know you mentioned Walmart, but What other ones are out there? Yeah, the Walmart Foundation partnership was special. Walmart Foundation really invested in this idea that 
strengthening justice system performance to weed out criminal actors and supply chains was going to make a big difference. And so we've done a series of projects with the Walmart Foundation, including research to assess what's happening in supply chains and the extent of forced labor and how justice systems are responding. Then to be able to scale casework and criminal analytics, to be able to target that casework at the most strategic spots, and also to work on government engagement and government advocacy in some of the most risky parts of the supply chain. So that's been a, a model partnership. We also have an amazing experience working with Target in India, actually, including raising up and empowering survivor networks and communities and building safe migration messages and pathways for workers who want to re-migrate after having been exploited in the first place. We work with an Australian bank called Westpac to prevent and end the sexual exploitation of children through online channels. And that's been a, an amazing partnership focused on the Philippines, really building up the capacity of Philippine law enforcement and justice systems to identify and prosecute traffickers who are, are selling children for sex. So really appreciate that partnership. We, we're partnering currently with Meta, both on that OSEC work and also on a new kind of trafficking that I'm not sure if you've heard of, Gwen, but tens of thousands are being forced to conduct scans in call centers in Southeast Asia and using Meta platforms and other tech platforms. We call it trafficking for forced criminality. And it's targeting a, a different population than the lowest skilled workers who are working in rice mills or on fishing boats. These are call center workers or tech workers who have been recruiting from all over the world, as I said, on tech platforms, and then asked to conduct scams against people from their home countries or other or Western countries. And these kind of scams really are defrauding people out of billions of dollars a year around the world and being perpetrated by transnational organized crime networks, largely out of special economic zones and other places where rule of law is weak here in Southeast Asia. Mm. So appreciate having the chance to partner with Meta on that at this point and looking for other partnerships in that space. And then we work with several industry associations or multi-stakeholder coalitions. Those are really valuable, especially for advocacy, because many Companies won't want to stick their necks out and be the only one to go to the government with a request, but not coalition. First of all, voices are amplified. And second, there's a, a relative comfort level. In that safety yeah. numbers idea. Yeah. 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 So we work with uh, the Seafood Task Force, which has uh, really taken it upon itself, especially industry members and also some NGO members to address the trafficking of reduced force labor on fishing boats that are first coming through Thailand. So that's been a, a great group of companies and NGOs to work with for the past years. We also work with the Responsible Business Alliance, mm. Responsible Labor Initiative. We're on that steering committee and then recently have become a member of Airbnb's Trust and Safety Advisory Coalition to develop proactive solutions to keep community and user safety at the forefront. I know Airbnb, that. that's neat. Yeah, I wouldn't have yeah. thought of that as a risk, but that makes sense, right? Use of their properties for... For trafficking. Oh, my goodness. I've learned all kinds of stuff today. Um, I had no idea that there was this forced criminality kind of trafficking going on either. But it makes sense when you think about it. I've heard about street gangs, even in the UK, forcing teenagers into criminality rings, you know, right. smash and grab organizations. Right. So it would make sense to do it virtually as well through a call center. But wow, fantastic. Yeah, we can talk about that in another episode, when, but uh, that's <laughs> all the thing. It's horrific violence that's being perpetrated in that space and on a different scale because they can reach into people's homes and cell phones. From, from anywhere. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. We're coming up on the end of the episode. Any kind of final thoughts and where can listeners reach you if they want to learn more about International Justice Mission or continue the conversation with you? How do they do that? Thanks, Gwen. I just kind of want to emphasize at the end here that although it may sound scary to contemplate the likely reality of forced labor somewhere in your supply chain and dauntingly complex to walk through all the layers, but ultimately I think this is the hopeful conversation because we do have tools that work. We know that providing access to remedy for workers and supporting law enforcement against criminal actors and supply chains really does reduce forced labor rates. And IJM is, is, in fact, ready to walk with companies towards their goals to eliminate forced labor and other human rights concerns. 
we definitely invite people to visit our website, www.ijm.org slash HT. I suppose HT can stand for hidden traffic, Gwen. Oh, hey, I like it. <laughs> uh, that'll lead to our corporate partnerships page where people can learn more about the model and past partnership impacts and ways to connect to our team. And we'd be happy to talk more. I'll add that link into the resources on this episode as well. So people, if you're listening to this, please know there's a resource page as well at the end of the episode and you can find the link there. So, well, thank you so much, Andre, for your time today. This has been great, but also hopeful, as you said. I mean, although this problem seems intractable and horrific, to hear that, you know, there's an 80% drop in one state in India already gives me hope that real change is happening and that you guys are leading that charge for change. So thank you for the work you do. I appreciate it. Thanks so much, Gwen. You're part of it too. And we all are doing this work. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you.